<laughs> that's right, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's start. Uh, I, uh, I did not add a haiku, but uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Gautam Tomas, um, or who goes by G, as you all know. Uh, yeah, so um, I guess it's great when you uh, advise a student and you learn stuff from your student. That's uh, ideal. And, uh, you know, for me, I, you know, I um, basically um, had no idea about testing. And uh, uh, thanks to Gene, now I know a little more. So um, it, was, it was great uh, advising him and uh, it's a pleasure to do it with you. So. Thank you, Kostas, for the introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm going to give my thesis defense on modern challenges in distribution testing. I've heard uh, the best defense is a good offense, so I'll try to be as offensive as possible today. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so modern challenges. I'm going to start by telling you what these modern challenges are, and then we'll move on to distribution testing. Right, so let's start with some motivation. There's recently been a lot of advances in image recognition, which has fueled technology such as self-driving cars. The issue with these type of image recognition techniques is they seem to be strangely brittle in practice or not very robust to uh, adversarial attacks, for example. To make this a bit more concrete, take a look at this. These are pictures of a turtle which has been 3D printed. To you and me, it looks like a turtle, right? But to a state-of-the-art image classifier, it thinks this is a rifle. So this is all fun and games, but imagine if it was the other way around. What if uh, you had a security checkpoint that thought a rifle was a turtle. Next, you might have heard that a lot of companies have been turning towards data-driven analytics in order to make product decisions. For instance, this image is supposed to evoke thoughts of, uh, for example, Netflix, which is very well known for this practice. In particular, the hit show House of Cards was developed based on their user analytics, deciding that their users would really love this type of show. But there's some challenges that they have to face when uh, doing analytics in this type of setting. Uh, in particular, they deal with very high dimensional data as they have, you know, thousands of movies and I'm sure hundreds of thousands or millions of users. Uh, so the point is their data is very high dimensional. And you really have to take this high dimensionality into account when making inference uh, decisions. Otherwise, you'll waste millions of dollars on a TV show that bombs. Finally, recent advances in uh, fabrication have allowed us to make DNA microarrays. These allow us to do gene expression studies. These gene expression studies give us insight on the origin of a number of diseases and their genetic origins. The issue here is that this genetic information is very, very valuable and very sort of personal. For example, if you're participating in a study for individuals who are HIV positive, you perhaps would not want it to be known uh, that you participate in the study, as this is socially, a somewhat socially stigmatic disease today. Uh, but it was shown recently uh, by Homer et al. in 2008 that participating in some of these studies can actually, you can re-identify who participated. Uh, so you want to be very careful not to violate an individual's privacy. So these are just three examples. The underlying trends here that I'm trying to show are that machine learning and statistics are key to extracting meaning from data, but these new domains bring unexpected challenges which we really have to face, otherwise we're going to run into a lot of problems. My research uh, focuses on fundamental statistical tasks with an emphasis on these challenges which are central to modern data analysis. The ones I alluded to before in the, in the introduction were robustness, high dimensions, and privacy, which are probably three of the major directions which I've worked in, uh, and a few others. I've worked on a number of statistical uh, tasks, but today I'm just going to focus on one uh, specific area, which is hypothesis testing, and use little vignettes to illustrate how each of these uh, issues come up and how we can deal with them in various settings. Good. So hypothesis testing or distribution testing is the fundamental scientific question asking, given a data set, was it generated according to some hypothesis distribution? This is, of course, the lifeblood of the scientific method. And if you think like back, you learned this back maybe in middle school science, the scientific method, which essentially boils down to the following two steps. You come up some, with some hypothesis about what you expect the data to follow. And then you test. You test if the data actually follows this model by running some sort of experiment. So it's kind of abstract, maybe. Uh, let's try to make it a bit more concrete with a non-scientific uh, example. Um, is the lottery fair? So I want to use the example of the Polish multi Tech, which is a lottery that ran in uh, Poland maybe in the 90s, I believe, maybe earlier, um, and it operated as follows. It drew 20 balls between the numbers 1 and 80, 
And the question is, is this lottery fair? By fair lottery, we mean that it should have equal chance of drawing each ball. Basically, is the distribution uniform over the balls? You'd want to either hope that it's fair, or if it's not fair, maybe you want to bet so that you can exploit this uh, non-fairness. And you can see here in an image that was compiled, I believe, by Eric and Ronit, uh, these are the drawing of the first 300, this is the result of the first 300 drawings. Uh, you might speculate that it may not be quite a fair lottery. Uh, but how do you really know uh, formally? This is the type of question that we might want to try to answer. Uh, is this lottery fair? So uh, let me tell you at a broad level what the problem tries to, a, a little bit more formally than I have so far, what we're trying to solve. We have some unknown distribution P which generates samples. This is sort of a, the, the distribution which our data came from. And then we have Q, which is our known hypothesis which we're trying to test against. And we're trying to do the following. Given samples from the unknown distribution P, distinguish whether P and Q are equal or not equal. So this goes by a number of names. Uh, identity testing is the one I'm gonna use in this talk, but you might have also heard it in as goodness of fit testing and as a one sample test since we're given samples from one distribution P rather than both P and Q, which is a two sample test. But again, identity testing is all you need to know for this talk. Of course, this is a very classical problem and it's enjoyed a lot of study over the years. So let me, in one slide, try to give you 100 years of history of what people have studied. This, of course, will be very incomplete. But there's been several very well-studied tests uh, for hypothesis testing. Some of these you might have heard of, especially Pearson's chi-squared or likelihood ratio tests. Some are perhaps a bit more obscure to some of you, like Kolmogorov Smirnov. But uh, there's many tests, and they go back over 100 years to Pearson, one of my personal favorite uh, mathematicians, because he basically invented you know, statistics uh, in some way or the other, uh, method of moments, all these things. Um, yeah, so some of the desiderata that they had back in the day, one thing is that they I see. Uh, so there's a caveat that I, I perhaps appreciate the art more than the artist uh, in this case, yes. <laughs> so there's a number of desiderata that they've kind of focused on over the ages, which is, of course, the natural goal to minimize the probability that the test is incorrect. This seems very natural, right? You want your test to be right. Uh, in the past, they've been able to rigorously limit the probability of saying that the two distributions are different when they are in fact the same. This is known as the significance or type one error. So there's ways of rigorously limiting this. But the other case, uh, there's not always a rigorous bound on errors when you're looking at a distribution which is not equal, equal to Q. Uh, this is often measured you know, empirically by testing a number of things and seeing what happens, but there's not always a rigorous limit in this case on the, what's known as the power or type two error. So that's one drawback of classical works. Another issue is that analysis frequently focuses on the asymptotic properties of the estimator. Uh, for example, as the number of samples in your test goes to infinity, is the result consistent? Is it uh, asymptotically Gaussian, et cetera? But the issue here is really that these depend on the number of samples going to infinity, which can be very bad in some cases. For example, if you're trying to study HIV AIDS, then you don't want the number of people infected with the disease to go to infinity before you can say anything. So really, we care about the finite sample regime. And this is what a recent focus has been in a number of fields, including my own, computer science, but also the neighboring fields of information theory and statistics, which has been focused on rigorous finite sample guarantees. So I've, to so I've told you why past uh, work has been perhaps a bit lacking in some of the things we might want nowadays. Uh, without further ado, let me tell you what the basic problem formulation is gonna be for the rest of this talk. <laughs> This is perhaps the most important slide, so if you have any questions about the problem formulation, please ask during this slide. So we're given the following. We're given samples from a distribution P over some discrete alphabet sigma. If you like, you can think of sigma being the numbers one through N. This will almost uh, always be the case, except in some sometimes, which I'll point out. And we'll have a description of a distribution Q over the same alphabet sigma. For example, one thing you could consider is say the uniform distribution, which if assigns the same mass to all elements. And then we're going to have a parameter epsilon greater than zero, which is going to be sort of some measure of how far distances are. Uh, think of this as being a small constant, like 0 0.1 or something. And the problem is as follows. I'll demonstrate first pictorially. So you can see there's kind of 
two, th there, there's two cases we have to answer correctly in. We have to answer in the case when p and q are equal, this tiny little dot in the center, we have to answer yes. In the case where the two distributions are far from each other by at least epsilon in L1 distance, then we have to answer no. And in the middle white regime, we don't really have any, uh, we can't give any guarantees there. So stating more mathematically, we have to decide whether the two distributions are equal versus far in L1 distance, where L1 distance is defined as follows. Uh, we want to have a success probability of, say, 90%. Uh, if you want something which is, l let me just note uh, as an aside that you can boost this up to an arbitrarily high probability at a low cost. But let's just focus here today on 90% probability of success. And our goal is really to uh, minimize the number of samples that we take from P, really like work in the case where our domain is, where we have, say, comparatively little data. Uh, ideally, we'd like something sublinear in the domain size. For example, just to be a bit more concrete, you could uh, w think of us working over a very, very, very large domain size, say a lottery over a billion elements, potentially. So this is the problem formulation. Let me pause for an awkwardly large time when I wait for any questions about this model, Ben? That's a very good question, and we'll get into that. Um, one reason why it's very much liked is because a one way of visualizing the, to the L1 or total variation distance is you kind of look at any event under the two distributions, and that's the maximum difference in the probabilities in the two distributions. Uh, kind of, yeah, like whatever outcome you want it to happen, that's the most that it could differ between the two. Any other questions? Yes, Daniel? Yeah, today let's suppose that it's given to you, say, like as an explicit list of each of the things. There may be more sparse representations if it's nicely structured. For example, uniform, I can tell you that with just one word, uh, uniform over n. But uh, yeah, in general, you can picture that you have, say, query access to each element. Cool. Anything else? No. So that's the, that's the definition. And what's known about this uh, problem? Again, the basic problem is to distinguish whether P and Q are equal versus far in L1. And this, uh, in a particular formulation, I guess I would consider it uh, initiated in this paper by Batu et al. Uh, depending if you go back maybe another year, there was like uniformity testing studied by Goldreich and Ron. But uh, let's for now just say uh, this problem started in this talk, uh, this paper. And very recently, or somewhat recently, it's been actually shown that the tight answer for this question is square root of the domain size over epsilon squared samples are both necessary and sufficient for this, uh, for this problem. Yes? That's a very good question, yeah. We'll revisit that in a few seconds, but I'll just say that the, for now that the problem becomes dramatically more difficult when you switch to that case. And you'll see, I'll, I'll try to illustrate that a bit later. So the answer, the tight answer is square root of the domain size over epsilon squared. And I just want to give you a very brief intuition as to where the lower bound, because I think it's uh, understandable for, every, for many people who have some basic intuitions about probability in some randomized algorithm sense. Uh, and the main answer where the square root n comes from is the birthday paradox. The birthday paradox is sort of the uh, surprising fact that uh, if you have a room with, say, about 27 or 28 people, then it's a 50-50 chance that two have the same birthday. And in particular, it's pretty likely, I'd say, that there's two people with the same birthday here today. Uh, but we don't have time to do that. But uh, roughly, <laughs> the, the intuition behind this lower bound is the fact that if you were looking at the distribution, yes, Brynmore? Oh, true, we have twins here. So yes, this is satisfied. <laughs> Assuming a uniform distribution over birthdays, so <laughs> this is an excellent observation, though. So yeah, more generally, though, uh, the idea is that if you're looking at a distribution which is uniform over the entire support versus a distribution which is uniform over a support of size n over 2, you wouldn't see any collisions until you see square root n samples, and therefore you couldn't tell which one you're looking at. So yeah, that's the basic intuition as to where the lower bound comes from, which I think is kind of neat. But, so this is, this is nice, right? We have tight upper bounds, tight lower bounds. The problem is solved, we can all go home. <laughs> Unfortunately not, there's a, as I've alluded to before, there's a number of modern challenges which I'm going to describe how my work in particular focuses on trying to address.
So one thing is handling model misspecification or to tolerance and robustness, kind of similar to the question that was asked before about why is it not close versus far. Testing against collections of distributions uh, where you know that not, you don't know that it's a single distribution, perhaps uh, it's a, in a collection of distributions. Higher dimensional problems, problems where we might have to be concerned with the privacy of individuals giving us their data, and cases where we have stronger access to the data instead of just a sampling model, maybe we have more power. So these, I'm gonna present these as five vignettes. Uh, they're going to be roughly self-contained, so if uh, one bores you or you get lost, uh, don't worry. When you see this slide again, then you can pay attention or not. I don't, I don't know, it's up to you. <laughs> so I'm gonna start with uh, handling model misspecification or what I like to consider some sort of robustness. So once again, the classic problem we're starting from is are two distributions equal versus far in L1 distance? And the question I wanna ask is how could we possibly model this unknown distribution P exactly. Let me try to illustrate this. So often we assume some idealized model Q, say like often we like to picture our data say Gaussian, but there's a number of reasons why this might not actually be the exact distribution which we come across uh, in the wild. For instance, there might be CLT style approximations which allow us to say something is like a Gaussian, but they're not exact. Um, there might be some errors when gathering data but overall, we have some true observed distribution P, which is somewhat different from the idealized model uh, Q. So just sort of to, to recap, what I'm trying to say is that models are inexact at capturing the true distributions in nature for a number of reasons, including, say, measurement errors, imprecisions in nature, uh, which I mean by CLT type approximations, and also more recently, and I think kind of cool, is poison data attacks. Uh, just to say a sentence more on this, Nowadays, when we gather data, it's often taken from the internet, and we don't really know where this data comes from. So it's possible some malicious actor might be in injecting some bad data in order to try to mess up your algorithm. So this is something that we really want to try to uh, take into account in our algorithms nowadays. And uh, this is one way through the lens of hypothesis testing that we try to understand this. Anyway, in short, there's a number of reasons why P and Q may be philosophically equal, but not literally equal. And I claim that in order to be useful in practice, tools really need to have some sort of tolerance or robustness to this type of model misspecification and handle these cases. Okay, so that's just a brief uh, thing about uh, robustness on why it's important. So let's, uh, instead of this basic question, testing whether they're equal versus far, let's test if they're close in some distance measure versus far in some other distance measure. This uh, goes back to a question that uh, Ben asked, why is L1 the right answer? In some cases, it might uh, not even be the right answer. Sometimes you might want to consider other distances, including, say, chi-squared, KL, Hellinger, et cetera. These are, uh, don't worry too much about how these are defined. I'll define the ones which are relevant, but these are a number of other distance measures. And so misspecification or robustness asks, what kinds of D1 can we handle? Uh, what can we test uh, non-trivially with these? Other motivations besides robustness for generalizing the problem in this sense include the fact that sometimes switching the, distri the distance measures will be uh, useful for classical uh, testing problems, including, say, testing monotonicity, which I'm gonna talk about in the next vignette. But then also, other distances are very natural for uh, certain settings. Uh, Kostas has done some work with uh, his other students, including uh, Ching Chuan, uh, Nishant, and a postdoc who is here, and, uh, but now a faculty in uh, uh, Singapore. China, China, Shanghai, uh, Nick Gravin. Uh, they worked on some work on um, Bayes nets and Markov chains, and they show that, uh, Be that, say, Hellinger is the right distance. But these are just sort of asides, and uh, don't worry too much about them. So, okay. Tolerant testing. So, again, like I said, the basic question we know very well that if we want to test if two distributions are equal versus L1 far, then this is the O of root N over epsilon squared. And this is the picture that I showed earlier. However, what about the question that was asked uh, by the gentleman in the back? What if two distributions are close versus far in L1 distance? So if you take a look at this picture, we're kind of growing the circle in the center. We have to answer yes to more distributions, thus making the problem harder. And unfortunately, the answer to this is no, that we can't test this in a strongly sublinear sense. Uh, in particular, before the answer was uh, roughly square root n, 
And now we've increased the sample complexity to n over log n. This is almost a quadratic increase in the sample complexity. This was shown by Greg and Paul Valiant a few years ago. Um, so this is kind of bad news. We've somehow lost out a lot, and if we want this tolerance, then we have to pay a lot more for it. Should we panic? No, we should relax, in fact. And by that I mean relax the problem. We're going to make the problem a bit easier and make it uh, somewhere between the two. Before I do that, I'll just point out this uh, other distance that I measured, the chi-squared distance. It's defined as pi squ minus qi squared divided by qi. You can think of this as a relatively rescaled uh, version of the L2 distance. Uh, there's a lot of things that are bad about it. For example, the fact that it's non-symmetric, uh, it's not a metric, uh, it doesn't obey triangle inequality, all of these things. But the one saving grace which will be very useful for us is by Cauchy-Schwartz. Uh, the chi-squared is greater than the L1 squared. Uh, don't worry too much about the technical implications of that because I'll point them out to you. Now if we try to do chi-squared closeness versus L1 farness, the problem becomes easier. That's all that's implied by that Cauchy-Schwartz in some sense. So now we've made the problem from this to this in some sense. This. Uh, the question is, what now? What's the sample complexity? And with uh, Kostas and uh, Jaidev, who's now at Cornell, we showed that uh, you can in fact do this in square root n over epsilon squared samples. In particular, uh, this shows that uh, you can in fact get chi-squared uh, chi tolerance at no additional cost in uh, sample complexity. I want to, yes? So is there a notion of if I take, um, if I take P as square, if I take Q as a random distribution and give L1 just an epsilon from P, should it be close to that breaking down to chi squared or should it be, I mean, is there a sense in which you would expect to have short specifically be chi or far from chi? Uh, off the top of my head, I think it would suggest, like you mean random as in you perturb each of the like things somehow? Yeah. I think my intuition, if, if first of all, if you do like a multiplicative uh, perturbation, almost certainly I think it would satisfy the chi-squared. Um, if it's sort of an additive uh, perturbation, I'd have to think about it a bit more. I think it depends on if you have like low probability elements or something. But uh, definitely, almost certainly a multiplicative approximation is the type of thing that chi-squared I think can handle very well. Cool. Uh, I, yeah, anything else I want to say here? I should mention that, uh, uh, yeah, at about the same time, uh, Ilias and Daniel Kane also had similar results, which also show this chi-squared uh, is somehow fundamental to a number of uh, different types. They, they showed it for their test. So I think this is somehow a fundamental type of tolerance. Let me tell you uh, that, uh, tell you some of the details about our tester. So again, we're trying to distinguish between these two cases. Are the two distributions close in L1, or chi-squared distance versus far in L1 distance? And the analysis, the test will suffer, go somewhat as follows. We're first going to draw Poisson M many samples from P. This is a random number. This may, might seem a bit odd, but I'll show you why this is useful. We're going to let Ni be the number of appearances of symbol I. One sort of straightforward thing that uh, is here is the fact that the number of occurrences of Ni, you'll see, is distributed as Poisson M times Pi. This is just the marginal distribution. But what's somewhat uh, interesting and very useful to us is that the fact that the NIs are now independent. This is, I think, a pretty cool fact. Just to contrast this, imagine you took uh, a fixed number of samples, uh, the fixed number of flips of a coin, and you saw, you saw a lot of heads. Then that would imply that the number of tails might be very small. But here, this is not the case, in fact. All the counts are now independent. So if you saw a lot of heads, then that doesn't tell you anything about the number of tails. And that's, I think, uh, very useful for the sake of analysis. Now, the statistic we consider is the following one, which might look like a mouthful, but let me try to unpack some of the useful intuitions about it. Ni is the number of times we see symbol i, and mqi is the number of times we'd expect to see symbol i if we were looking at q. So it essentially boils down to taking that difference and squaring it, uh, doing a few more tweaks, uh, subtracting out this ni and rescaling it, but really it's sort of a squared difference and then appropriately rescaled. This might look kind of weird, but if you squint at it, uh, this looks kind of like the chi-squared distance. And that's because essentially it is. The expectation of the statistic we can understand very well is the chi-squared uh, distance rescaled by a factor of m. In other words, this allows us to separate uh, the expectation of the statistic in the two cases. In particular, in the first case, you know just that 
uh, it's small, just straightforwardly. But the other case, using the Cauchy-Schwartz relationship I mentioned before, you can show that the expectation is large. So we've separated the expectation. With a little bit more work, it's possible to show that you can bound the variance of the statistic as well. And with a separated expectation and a bounded variance, uh, then you can apply Chebyshev's inequality and that will uh, give you a correct test statistic with say 90% probability. So that's essentially how the analysis of this goes. I wanna make a brief uh, remark that Pearson's chi-squared statistic uses a very similar test Remember, this is about 100 years old and it's very similar, it's almost optimal. But the change that uh, we and some others have also made uh, is subtracting this ni in the numerator seems to decrease the variance greatly. And this might be useful in practice at the heuristic for making much better chi-squared test uh, statistics. Okay, so now let me, uh, let's, that's how the test works. Let me sort of summarize. We've shown two results now, which I'm going to show in this table. So each of these squares corresponds to one testing problem. This is the classical result, which shows that uh, if you want to do equal versus far in L1, then it's n over epsilon squared, root n over epsilon squared. And this is our result that I mentioned just now, which is square root n over epsilon squared for chi squared tolerant in L1 versus L1 testing, or total variation testing. So you'll notice these problems get harder as you're going down the table. And like I mentioned, uh, there's other things, you, other distances you can consider. Trust me when I say that these problems are harder as you go down. So one of the hardest ones is if you want to test TV close versus TV far. Again, this is equivalently L1 close versus L1 far. And it's known that N over log N samples are required, necessary and sufficient for this problem. So there's two other types of uh, tolerance which are not, maybe not immediately clear. Uh, you know, if you want to do tolerance in other distances, can you do it efficiently? Are they sort of green or are they orange? Are they more expensive? And together with Costas and uh, John Wright here, we managed to show that in fact that these are unfortunately expensive. Uh, sort of chi-squared tolerance is where the free lunch ends and then you have to start paying a lot. And we didn't just do farness and total variation, we also expanded this way. Uh, I don't know, I was just especially proud of this table and I thought it looked cool so I wanna show you but I don't expect you to actually read and interpret everything here. I wanna just unpack uh, some of the things that we, one of some of the things that we learned and found uh, if you change the farness distance in, uh, to be Hellinger instead of L1, this is again the same cost as before, root n over epsilon squared. If you wanna be robust in distance measures, then it seems like chi squared or uh, L2 are the ones which you can do for free. But everything else is expensive, it seems like. And just as one sentence, I wanna say that if you didn't know either distribution, the picture is qualitatively very different. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about my first vignette about uh, robustness. Uh, essentially, we sort of characterize when you can and can't get uh, tolerance for free in these testing problems. Cool, so that's the first vignette. Next, I'm going to go to testing against collections of distributions, which uh, Themis talked about in his talk, and it's the same sort of framework. So we're gonna be testing for structure. Again, the classic problem is just testing whether two distributions are equal versus far. But why only a single distribution Q? Consider you're a scientist and you don't, you're not just, why would you know exactly the type of distribution you're testing against? Perhaps you have a more broad hypothesis asking, is my data distributed according to some binomial distribution or is it like a Gaussian? These are perhaps more like the questions you might ask. So I wanna test against a whole class of distributions. Uh, is, a distribu is P in some class or family or is it far from it? meaning is it far at L1 distance from every distribution in the class? Uh, the question you might ask is what class are interesting? Uh, I claim the ones that we're gonna study and uh, that we studied and which may be interesting are those with simple structural properties. Uh, in particular, I wanna just point out that the family may be infinite. For example, if I told you C is either, you know, the uniform distribution or, you know, the uniform distribution over the first half, that's not too hard to do. You can test one, then the other. But I'm saying, what if I gave you an infinite list of distributions and I wanted to tell you, is it one of these or is it far? So this is less clear how to do. And in this talk, we're going to focus on, as a running example, all monotone distributions. A monotone distribution is one where the probabilities, let's say, are non-increasing. Uh, to show you a picture, I think, uh, which illustrates it easily is, does it look like this or is it sort of all over the place? <laughs> 
And this is what I'm going to use as a running example, but our results also hold for other classes, including you know, modality, log concavity, MHR, and testing whether a distribution has independent marginals, which I think is especially cool. So what are our results? We can show that testing monotonicity over the domain of size uh, n is root n over epsilon squared samples. Uh, this might look familiar. This is exactly the bound for uniformity testing, which I think is rather neat that, you know, testing against just one simple distribution, we, for the same sample complexity, we can test against a much richer class of distributions. And this compares to the prior work, um, which was done by Batu, Kumar, and Rubenfeld back in 04. They initiated it, and there was some roughly contemporaneous work by uh, Clement Canan, Elias Diakonikolas, Demis Guliakis, and Ronit, uh, which was, it still had this root n dependence, but there were some extra polylog n factors, and the epsilon dependence uh, wasn't quite this epsilon squared. And then we managed to also do this in higher dimensions. We can get a tester for monotonicity over the hypergrid in d dimensions, which is n to the d over 2 over epsilon squared. This can uh, be compared with the previous best, which is n to the d minus 0.5. Uh, so you can see ours is almost a quadratic uh, improvement in the sample complexity over this work by, no, this time the B is not Batu. Uh, this time it's Bhattacharya, Fisher, Rubenfeld, and uh, Paul Valiant. Uh, so we managed to show a much better algorithm there. You might be thinking that uh, this is kind of bad still, n to the d over 2. This is an exponential dependence. We have matching lower bounds, which I'm going to revisit in the next vignette. So this is kind of the best you can do. And it's a unified approach, which also works uh, for unimodality, log concavity, MHR, et cetera. And this is joint work uh, in a previous paper that I mentioned with Jayadev and Kostas. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that, so there's actually a log, uh, in, for example, in the first uh, result, there's a plus log over epsilon, uh, either cubed or to the four. I think it's to the four right now. Um, basically saying that as long as epsilon is not incredibly small uh, in comparison to uh, n, then we're okay. Uh, similar type of things for monotonicity, but uh, I think in the most interesting regimes, this is, a, this is a tight. Cool. Now, I want to give you uh, an idea of how the algorithm works because I think it's uh, actually somewhat intuitive with a crucial technical twist to it. Uh, and it's going to be a testing by learning type approach. So let me just uh, sort of uh, philosophize on the best way perhaps to you know, learn to test against an entire class of distributions. The natural way is to reduce it to something we already know how to do. We know how to test against one distribution. So my two-step approach, which I'm going to get into, is we first try to learn a hypothesis, a single distribution that we want to test against, and then we see if we were any good, if it was correct. So I'll formalize that here. Uh, so our learn then test type framework. We're first going to learn a hypothesis Q in the class with the following uh, desiderata. We're going to uh, have the requirement that if we actually are looking at, say, a monotone distribution, we want to output a monotone distribution, which is close in chi-squared distance. So this needs, uh, this is known as proper learning. And I claim we can do this. Don't worry too much about the step. Uh, there exist algorithms for this purpose. And the other case, we need that uh, if the distribution is actually far from the class, then the two distributions are far from each other. This is sort of automatic because by definition, uh, Q is in the class and P is far from the class. Therefore, P and Q are far from each other. So OK, we've learned a hypothesis at this point, And now we want to perform tolerant testing. We've sort of picked out a best guess for our hypothesis, and now we've reduced it to this testing problem, which actually might look familiar from the previous uh, vignette. We want to test whether P and Q are close in a chi-squared distance versus far in L1 distance. And in fact, as I showed, as I mentioned, we, can, we showed that this is root n over epsilon squared. I the crucial thing that I want to point out here is if you just took a naive approach, like the most natural thing is just to do L1 learning, L1 testing, everything L1, this would require n over log n samples due to the lower bound I mentioned by Greg and Paul Valiant. But the crucial the tweak that we did here is really to learn in chi-squared distance, which make things work out nicely. 
And uh, like I said, are there cheap proper learners? Uh, I wanted to say that the cost of step two is in most cases, as I sort of alluded to in Roni's question earlier, uh, it's much cheaper to do step one than step two unless you're in a sort of very unusual regime, in my opinion. So that's what I want to say about uh, testing against class of distributions. Uh, we, can, we, can, we, we made a framework which works very well for a number of different uh, class of interest. So the next, uh, the pr perhaps the last uh, long vignette I want to talk about is multivariate distributions. And let me just start off with an example. Which patients have pneumonia? Suppose you were in a clinical setting and you were trying to automatically diagnose which patients have pneumonia. Now, ideally, you'd like to have a doctor look at every single patient, but uh, perhaps, you know, resources are limited and there's too many patients, so you don't have time to uh, do this individually for each one. Is there some sort of algorithm that can do it for you? Now, if you want to use machine learning, how would you do this typically? Well, you'd design some sort of model. So you can see here that each of these are going to be some sort of binary features, so whether someone has pneumonia or not, but there's going to be other features which are somehow connected with it. Uh, for example, whether someone's age 65 plus, whether someone has a high heart rate, whether they're wheezing or have a cough. These are all sort of uh, different features which you might consider. And how do you design this model? Well, you do it in perhaps via heuristic methods. For example, you say you have an expert. A doctor says, you know, if somebody's wheezing and they're coughing, then they're probably going to have pneumonia, especially if they have a high heart rate as well. They'll sort of give you some tips on how to design a model. But the real question is, how do you know whether what they told you actually is reasonable? How do you test for the, whether this model is accurate? And that's the type of setting which we might want to consider hypothesis testing. Uh, so what I'm trying to get the underlying sort of uh, theme here is that most data in the real world is high dimensional in the sense that imagine we have D features, then the alphabet size, which was previously, you know, uh, say one through N, now we know that's going to be exponentially larger than the dimension D. You could imagine with the pneumonia example, there may, might be, say, uh, hundreds of features which you might consider whether, when deciding whether someone has pneumonia. Therefore, two to the hundred is probably bigger than you can handle uh, in many cases. So this seems, the, this seems like bad news because our goal is really algorithms which scale polynomially in the dimension. Uh, so this seems at odds with each other, and in fact, it is uh, at odds with each other because the fact is that, as we showed uh, in this paper, two to the d over two samples are required for testing many natural properties of distributions, including, say, independence, et cetera. Um, I, I'm gonna say for other properties, it's not, it's not that complicated. In particular, if you wanna test uh, just uniformity, it follows from previous lower bounds I mentioned. But the point is that testing in high dimensions is a costly operation in general. We really face the curse of dimensionality where we face a sample complexity which is exponential in dimension. In these cases, even if you think you have big data, when you're compared with such massive domains, your big data is really quite small. So the question is how do we evade uh, the curse of dimensionality? And that can be done by making modeling assumptions over the underlying uh, distribution which are, generates our data. Stated another way, one, one way I like to think about this which may make sense uh, to uh, a CS audience is very the fact that, you know, when we're constructing these lower bounds for distribution testing, often it involves very fine-grained moving of probability mass from one, uh, from one string to another string. Uh, it requires a lot of work on the hand of the adversary. The question, another way of phrasing this is sort of, what if the adversary was more limited in what he could do in some sense? What if uh, he had to operate within some class of probability distributions which is more structured and natural? Uh, my sort of one line phrase I like to say, I like to believe that nature is not out to get me. So uh, testing in that regime, can we do any better? And uh, this motivates me to tell you about the, uh, the Ising or Easing model. This is a canonical graphical model which is used heavily in machine learning. It's an example of what you might know as a Markov random field. And uh, it's a distribution on a graph, hence the name. Uh, with, in this talk, I'm just gonna say it has some edge parameters. These edge parameters are going to indicate uh, how strong two features are correlated with each other. And it's going to be a binary model which is over plus minus one to the V. So this is kind of abstract, but let me try to illustrate it with the previous example I gave. So you can see now I've put some edge weights here. You can see that there's the age 65 plus feature which has a very weak edge with pneumonia 
Uh, these are just example ways. Um, but the idea is that perhaps just being uh, age 65 plus does not necessarily indicate a strong correlation with having pneumonia. On the other hand, you can see I've put perhaps much stronger edge weights between wheezing and coughing and pneumonia, uh, one, 1 and 1.5, because they might be a much stronger sign of it. One last thing that might be a bit uh, not obvious at first is you might wonder, okay, but aren't wheezing and coughing, uh, aren't they correlated somehow? Even though, the, and I'm going to say that even though there's no edge between them, they actually have a, a, a correlation which goes through pneumonia. Since wheezing and pneumonia are correlated, pneumonia and coughing are correlated, therefore, you know, wheezing and coughing are going to be correlated as well. If this didn't make sense to you, all I'm trying to say is that there's some rather complicated structures that could exist in these graphical models, and they're not, it's not always easy what's going on, to understand what's going on. Uh, in case you like math, which I'm sure many people here do, here's the actual uh, PDF. It's proportional to this uh, expression here, which just does what I said uh, before. You have x u and x v, and you kind of have an edge parameter in front of them, which indicates whether they're related or not, and how strong they are. Uh, in our work, yes, we do, but just for the sake of presentation, I'm just saying it without. Uh, and one of the key things to note is that there's only O of D squared parameters here, because we can have at most one uh, thing per edge, versus two to the D for general distributions. So somehow, there's far fewer parameters in this distribution than there were before. And if you're uncomfortable with the idea that, you know, Ising models, like what is this, is this a physics talk that I wandered into? Uh, while these were introduced in statistical physics, they've seen a number of applications in other areas, such as computer vision, neuroscience, and social sciences. In particular, one application that I want to mention, which is very relevant nowadays, is Ising models are frequently used to um, indicate how new technologies are adopted in social networks. So in other words, when you're doing testing on social networks, these are a very natural model. And so I want to tell you, just sort of summarize our results on testing on Ising models, which is uh, joined with uh, Kostas and uh, Nishant, who's right there, who's another one of Kostas' students. Uh, we had a couple of papers. Our main result uh, is that efficient testing is indeed po possible with polynomial in the dimension and one over epsilon samples, thus evading the cursive dimensionality that I mentioned before, which requires exponentially many samples. So, in short, what we said is, if you know your data is coming from an Ising model, you can do much better than uh, the naive uh, methods. And in fact, we also have improved upper bounds for certain uh, restrictions of Ising models, certain types of Ising models. For example, if you knew that your Ising model also only had po positive correlations, you can do better. Similarly, if you knew that it was a tree structure, you can do better. And finally, high temperature uh, also lets you do something better. Now, this might scare you once again. Are we back in a statistical physics talk? Uh, it's a very natural idea, which has a somewhat weird name, but high temperature roughly corresponds in some way to sort of bounded correlations. And let me try to illustrate that with a picture. So what, are your, what is the improved upper bound that you're using? Is that uh, polynomial? No, no, it's still polynomial, uh, which we show we have a lower better bound. Yeah, yeah, just better polynomials. Uh, so I want to illustrate via what high versus low temperature means in these pictures. So each of these uh, is one sample from an Ising model on a grid graph. What I did was I let plus one be uh, blue and minus one be red. And uh, the grid has, uh, like the edge parameters are the same for all the edges in the grid, which range from one here to zero over here. So you'll note over to the left of this line, we have what, uh, what's, what's known as, say, the low temperature regime. In this regime, we have, very so, we're, we have very strong edge parameters, and you'll notice that you get these big splotchy regions here. You can see there's very high correlations in some sense. But when you move to the right of this line, you'll see that with lower edge parameters, you get something that looks much more random. You see far fewer correlations. And essentially, when I say we can do uh, testing in the high temperature regime, we could do testing on any model to the right of this line more efficiently. Uh, that's sort of a statement of our results. And I want to give you just a one slide technical vignette onto some of the challenges that we face here, which is how do we bound variance of statistics? In the sense that you remember in the previous two vignettes ago, perhaps, uh, maybe you don't remember uh, by now, but the idea was that you, know, you separate the expectations and then you bound the variance. Bounding the variance was 
a little bit of work, but you could do it there. But here in these highly correlated, high dimensional settings, it's much less clear how to do it. So more, more sophisticated tools are needed. So let me just uh, give you uh, one slide on what the challenges we face are. Imagine you have just a random, you have a string, uh, x1 through xd, which are each plus minus one uh, random variables, and you wanted to sum them up. The question here is what can we say about the distribution of this sum? Now, if all the summons are independent, this is very easy and very well understood. We know that this is the binomial distribution, up to some weird shifts. This is essentially the binomial distribution, which enjoys a number of nice properties. In particular, the binomial distribution has a comparatively small variance, its order of d, rather than order d squared, which is the worst case uh, for, this, uh, for a function over the same domain. And even stronger than this variance bound, we know that it enjoys very sharp concentration of measure. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, around the expectation, there'll be a lot of probability but mass, but as you go further from the expectation, the probability drops off very, very quickly uh, with after you pass some radius. Uh, if, you, if you want some intuition, just like picture a Gaussian. You can know like it has a lot of mass near the center, but when you go say two standard deviations, three standard deviations out, you have very small probability mass as a rough intuition. However, when we're dealing with Ising models, what is, in this case, the summons are not independent. And furthermore, we're dealing with, uh, it turns out to be necessary for analysis to look at functions which are more complicated, like uh, bilinear statistics rather than linear statistics. And in this case, using uh, things like martingale concentration uh, arguments, uh, it turns out that we can actually show, you know, despite this very rich structure that Ising models enjoy, we can still prove very strong, sharp concentration of measure, which is qualitatively similar to as if they were all independent, which I think is, it surprised me a little bit, but cool. So that's all I wanted to say about high dimensional testing. The rough uh, part of the story, is, is the story that I want to say here is the fact that if you assume some sort of structure on your underlying distribution, then you can do much better in terms of the sample complexity and avoid the curse of dimensionality. So the last two vignettes are going to be somewhat shorter, maybe just a slide or two each, just to give you a flavor for the type of problems. Uh, and the next one is data privacy. What I want to get across is something, maybe state the obvious, that rigorous data privacy is quite important. And let me tell you about the Mass Massachusetts Group Insurance Commission incident from 97. In this case, the Mass GIC, they released anonymized data on the state employee hospital visits. This might be kind of worrying to you at first, you know, releasing hospital visits of all the employees, but they told you, don't worry, don't worry. It's anonymous. They removed everything like the name, the address of individuals, and social security numbers of individuals. Of course, these are very private and personal, personally identifying information. However, what they didn't remove was things like an individual's sex, birthday, and zip codes. So actually, it turns out that Latanya Sweeney, who's currently at Harvard, she cross-referenced this uh, sex birthday zip code information with the voter records. Voter records are either uh, free or you can buy them for like 50 bucks. And she managed to identify a number of individuals. In particular, as uh, my friend Lucas told me just before, I was, uh, before this talk, they actually involved driving around to a bunch of houses and seeing which ones matched. And in the end, they managed to identify the governor of Massachusetts and send him his own medical records. So this should be a clear sign that, you know, privacy is very important, but if you just do, you know, some like vague heuristics, uh, things are going to fail catas catastrophically, which motivates uh, private distribution testing. Credit for the name goes to Costas for this one. Uh, so in this setting, this is, the, this is the setting we have. We have some unknown distribution P, which uh, generates samples and we form some database and then an analyst, uh, who may or may not be a canine, uh, reads the data. And there's sort of two goals that we have here. The first goal is sort of the classic goal I've told you about for the last 45 minutes, roughly. Uh, you know, are we, we're trying to test whether P and Q are equal versus far in L1 distance. But the additional desiderata that we have now is number two, where you have to guarantee privacy of X1 through Xm. So the people who gave you their data, you somehow have to make sure you don't divulge too much about that. Uh, and I just want to tell you that the notion of privacy that we are often concerned with is uh, that of differential privacy. This was introduced about a decade ago and is very well received. Uh, it's used in theory. It uh, 
It, uh, for example, won the Girdle Prize last year. But also in practice, uh, where companies like Apple, Facebook, Google are also all using uh, this, uh, this as well. So this is kind of like the gold standard that people use right now for data privacy. I want to mention that pre previously these type of hypothesis testing uh, problems were studied in the classical sense by a number of people, that is, as the asymptotic uh, sample complexity goes to infinity. But we were the first to study it from the finite sample regime. This was followed up by a, a work by, another, by other awesome uh, groups, including uh, Jayadev with his two students, Yuteng and Huan Yu, as well as Mariam uh, concurrently was working on this with Ilias and Ronit. So it seems like this is a cool area where we can get a lot of results from. Uh, and in another work with uh, Jayadev and his students, Huan Yu and Zuteng, we also uh, studied other properties, which I'm not going to get into in this talk. Uh, I, I claim credit for the title inspector. Try to figure out what it means. Anyway, that's all I want to say about uh, for private distribution testing. The very last thing I want to say is just one slide on if we have, imagining we had stronger access to the data. And this goes back to something Themis mentioned in his talk, conditional sampling. So what's the vanilla or basic sampling model? Uh, the basic sampling model is the following. You press a button, you get a sample from the distribution. Press another button, get another sample. It's a very non-interactive process. You just collect your data and then you do something with it. But what if instead we were working in some stronger model, which I'm going to call, which I'm going to say is the cond model. In this case, we now submit a query set S and then we receive a sample conditioned on being from that set S. Uh, so we kind of have more power here. We can ask questions uh, from the, of the distribution in some sense. Uh, and I want to, like I've sort of said, this is an active learning model where we have much more interactive uh, power. Just to give you an example of why, why this might come up, you could imagine election polling. One perhaps bad way of doing election polling is, you know, ask a random person from the universe what they think of uh, Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump, and you do this again and again, but this doesn't give you very useful data. Perhaps what you might do instead is, you know, asking a certain demographic, you know, ask people in Iowa between the ages of 18 and 25 what they think, that might give you more meaningful data. The idea is when you're a pollster, you would actually do some sort of uh, conditioning and try to query in a very specific sets rather than just blindly gathering data. And uh, this model is quite spectacular in the sen sense that it can give you lots of new bounds. Uh, as I've told you all through this talk, uh, square root n becomes O of 1 essentially for uniformity testing uh, and general identity testing as well. So I don't want to tell you too much about what we have here. We just have uh, a lower bound for a certain problem, that is when you're testing whether two distributions are equal versus far, but now you only have sample access to both of them, hence two sample testing. And uh, with uh, Jayadev and Clement Canon, we showed an adaptive lower bound of square root log log n for this problem. The reason why I think this is kind of cool is I, I often have trouble understanding how to reason about uh, adaptive algorithms because, you know, they can make decisions at each step of your sampling process. So I think this was kind of cool to figure out uh, what can an adaptive algorithm really do here or not. Uh, yeah, that's all I want to say about that. Unfortunately, I don't have time to explain what this slide is. Uh, you can talk to me after. But uh, okay, <laughs> I just want to conclude. <laughs> So we built a principled understanding for distribution testing in a number of settings core to modern data analysis, including robustness, high dimensions, privacy, composite hypothesis testing, and when we have stronger access to data. And I think it's time, it's really cool that we have this understanding, and I'd like to reap the benefits of this. I'd like to somehow use these theoretical tools to give us improvement for real world problems, like really uh, get something out of this. And on the other hand, going the other direction, I'd like to understand which real world problems can give us interesting theoretical questions for study. So that concludes the technical part of this talk. I just want to spend a few slides. I want to thank, uh, here's a sample of cool people, uh, including all my co-authors and some others. Let me just uh, highlight some of the people who have really been in the trenches with and like worked very closely with as students. Uh, and yeah, I owe them a lot, I've learned a lot from them but also I'd like to highlight some of the people who have really mentored me through my PhD and even before. For example, Bobby and Nicole were really great when I was uh, you know, just getting into theoretical computer science. Uh, Jayadev is one of the ones who's been really key in getting me into distribution testing. Ilias has uh, been, been there and he always has a number of really good questions for us to work on. 
uh, Ankur and Ronit, of course, have always been an uh, inspiration, and I've worked with them. With I've worked with Ankur also on robustness, and Ronit's always been a guide to me. And Kostas, he's he's been pretty good. <laughs> More later, if he passes me. And uh, everyone's been showing pictures of the theory group. Uh, they've everyone's been choosing the exact same picture. I'm going to reveal my age and show this picture from the 2012 theory retreat. Uh, I think pretty much everyone here has uh, graduated by now. Um, I'm one of the few people left, so hopefully I'll be able to soon join their ranks. Uh, I'd like to thank also other friends at MIT. I wasn't able to get a picture in time uh, and really capture all of them, but I think the greater MIT community. And even beyond that, a lot of my friends uh, from college and elsewhere who are in the area, they've really made my life a lot more enjoyable in my time here in Boston. Um, and of course, I'd like to thank my family my parents were in the back, and my brother and sister-in-law, who have been very supportive through a large part of my PhD. Thank you. project which has uh, gone on for a very long time, which I hopefully plan to finish up with uh, Christo sometime soon, is called Anaconda for reasons which I can get into, but uh, Sam Elder is actually responsible for it. Uh, uh, just to explain quickly, the, we have the cond sampling model, but if you imagine that you had non-adaptive access, then that would be N A cond. And if you put A on the front and end of it, it becomes Anaconda. So based on this joke, I wanted to write a paper around it. So we're still working on that, hopefully sometime <laughs> soon. Yes? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think, uh, so the, the main, just trying to naively port the source stuff is very challenging in the sense that, uh, you know, L1 distance somehow is not very good for continuous distributions when you're getting samples, in the sense that I claim that there's no finite sample tester which can tell you if a distribution is discrete or continuous for kind of uh, silly reasons, but it's still a lower bound. So in so, what you have to do naturally is assume there's some sort of structure on your distribution in order to get some sort of finite bound. So Ilias has some work on this stuff with uh, Daniel Kane and uh, one of his, uh, Ilias' students, Vladimir Nikishkin. Uh, so basically uh, assuming some sort of, uh, if you want to get some sample complexity bounds like we have, you'd have to assume some sort of structure. I think, uh, I think this is a good question though to try to make more tools which are useful uh, in practice because this is what a lot of people care about, yes. Exactly, yeah, so just uh, what uh, Costa said, like another type of distance like Kolmogorov makes it very easy to test, especially in one dimension. We have some work uh, which uh, I guess has been on the table for, uh, tabled for a little bit, but uh, trying to understand Kolmogorov testing in say higher uh, dimensions just to understand what, what gaps exist. But yeah, it's a very good question about the continuous domain. Any other questions? <laughs> 